It's all about faith, passion, obviously the drive with the guys that I've been around and the guys that surround me every single day. Uh, but a part of that is having the will to succeed. Um, you know, knowing that you put the work in and have the confidence to let it show. Um, what I tell people is just be the best version of yourself in anything that you do. You don't have to live anybody else's story. Um, sometimes people make it seem like you have to have certain prerequisites or, or a crazy life story in order to be successful in this world. Um, but the truth is you, you really don't. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you have or don't have, what you lack, what you have too much of, but all you need to have is, is faith in God, an undying passion for what you do, or what you choose to do in this life, and a relentless drive and the will to do whatever it takes to be successful and whatever you put your mind to. Make sure you live in the moment and work your butt off every single day. And I hope I inspire people all around the world to just be themselves, be humble, and be grateful for all the blessings in your life. If I had email, I would be inundated. I choose not to have email or ever turn a computer on. Now, all my companies are state-of-the-art, technologically advanced. If I want something printed out, it's printed out for me. But I do this out of choice. I'd rather make a phone call to you or write you a letter and communicate the way you deserve to be communicated with. And no disrespect to people on email, and I'd be so inundated, my gosh, I'd be on that computer all day long. I prefer to have that personal touch, and it seems to work. With all the companies I have that I'm quite active in, but I have great presidents running most of them, Thank God, I'm very blessed there, right, to take care of the details, but I'm still hands-on in many, many of the businesses here. And it's, I can work better that way. And it goes down to this, pay attention to the vital few, ignore the trivia many. Mm -hmm. If I had email, no disrespect, there'd be a lot of trivia on there I'd be answering. Mm -hmm. I try and pay attention to the vital few and ignore the trivia many. What do you d differentiate those, those two categories to being? Like where would, let's say, your president be and where would like the head of a sales division be? It, Are they on two sides of that equation? No, what it is is if it's one of my companies, you could call me directly. Mm -hmm. But people know, call me directly if you have to, but don't bother me with something someone else can handle. And they do it, it works really, really fine, works really well. But uh, what's important would be obviously presence of company, anyone that's involved with me, either philanthropically, mm -hmm. the main people philanthropically are the main people in my businesses, mm -hmm. or places or countries I want to reach out to. If the head of a country will call me, I'll call them right back. You know, things that are very significant. Insignificant are, I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. in my life it has been significant. I'm hit up every month for hundreds of requests. Send me $100, send me $2 million, you have all the money, share it with me. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't even touch it, I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm swarmed, mm -hmm. I do so much philanthropy now everyone expects that whether it's a two million dollar mortgage or hey I want to start a new business send me fifty thousand dollars because you have money I don't mm -hmm. that people should do it. well that's not true mm -hmm. I spend millions on philanthropic work but I do it through our foundation where it really makes sense not where I have to go through it all myself so, so my question is how do you begin to set up that system so that you have the and I'll call it a luxury in some mm -hmm. ways of communicating as you see fit when you see fit with those sure. key decision makers well for starters I'm, I'm the chairman of the board mm -hmm. okay of the major company so mm -hmm. I know detail what's going on from the chairman of the board's point of view. I also know that the people that I've hired can do what they're doing much better than I can. And I know what I need to know and so do they. So they could pick up the phone and call me, JP, we just did this or look what we're doing here. I also attend meetings on a regular basis to see where we're at and where we're going and meet with marketing people, meet with promotional people, meet with our educational people, sports marketing people to get a hands-on feel for what we're doing, where we're going, and in those really important meetings, I sit in to help make the decisions. I think things through. I'm a games and theory guy, and I, and I sort of ponder options before I make decisions. Mm. So I'm less the act from my heart guy, and just sort of say what I'm thinking, and in terms, I'll in turn internalize a bit and try and imagine like chess game, the possible outcomes, and then act accordingly to what I think might be the best. And I think that goes sort of with what a magician thinks through as well. Right. Like a, a, a stage magician has to keep two steps ahead, look over here, look over here, while something else is going on over here. Or a close-up magician's got to be very aware of outs and options. So I guess magician at heart would probably be that. I sort of think like a magician. 
My parents couldn't afford to put me in a lot of like dance classes and things yeah. like that. But we, they would throw me into like the community ones and it created this... The free ones, yeah. The free ones, yeah. yeah. And then eventually when I started acting, or it started with modeling and then I t it turned into acting, they didn't approve of it. They didn't have the money to support it. Mm. So with my jobs, I would pay for the headshots and I would go take classes and yeah. take four different buses and a subway to get downtown from the suburbs in Toronto where I lived yeah. to get to the class. Like I wanted it. And yeah. if, like if I didn't actually put in the work for it, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am. And, yeah. and it really had to be from within. I remember one day I was having a terrible day at school. Nothing could go right. And whether it was about me or my friends or something at home, it just, I just wasn't happy that day. And someone came up to me, or not even came up to me, just walked by me and said something like, I like your hair, or you look rested today, or whatever it was, seemingly insignificant, but it had the most significance because it completely turned my day around. And that's the kind of thing that, that I felt and recognized and told myself, I made a mental note, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do that from now on. Whenever, I'm gonna make it a point at least once a day, if not more, hopefully 10, 20 times a day, to walk up to someone or walk by someone and point out something about them that I like or say something nice and positive because it could change their day. It could make them feel good about themselves, and it will actually, because I know that it felt, made me feel that way. A few times that I thought I, I booked it, like for sure, and you didn't, <laughs> and like just being heartbroken and, um, you know, having my mom and my dad kind of pick up the pieces. And I think that that was the, f you know, the few times that they actually, you know, started to question themselves are we doing the right thing by letting them do it and do this and, um, and try to act and take on this, this profession that. You know, it's such a gamble, it's a lottery, you know, such a lottery. And um, you just train yourself to like manage your expectations for the most part when it comes to auditions. I used, to, I know a system that I started doing was like after the audition, after I left out, I would just throw my sides away. You know, if they really want me, I'll just print them out again. You know, I'll, I'll go out and I'll go through the hassle, go to Kinko's, and cause I didn't have a printer at the time and, and print them out again. And, uh, and that was just my way of training myself to just forget about it when you leave. You know, it's not it's out of your hands. You've done, you've done all you can do worrying about it. It's not gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, help, help you get the job. So, um, I mean, it's tough, you know, when it has nothing to do with you. You know, you, you, could, be, you could have the most talent in the world, um, feel as though you're perfect for it and still not get it because, you know, maybe the other lead is a little too tall and you, you know, and you guys don't compliment each other well on screen. It has nothing to do with you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And um, just kind of wrapping your head around the process and knowing that it's completely out of your hands it's just easier for you to kind of let go and, and, and move on to the next thing. So I'm bringing up this failure, this quit, this quitting. I'm bringing this up to you now because, I don't know, giving up on that video made me realize that uh, I need to focus more on my YouTube videos. You know, my head's been really focused on, on Beam and on family and all these other things happening in my life but I still get all these crazy ideas and instead of investing a bunch of time to realize those ideas like I used to, I try to rush them and it always leaves me with something that, that's unsatisfactory. So I'm just bringing all this up to you now to let you know I'm gonna be giving my videos more focus and more attention because this is kind of the only thing that gives me a tremendous sense of fulfillment in my career, kind of in my life, I'm beyond family and stuff. And I miss that, I wanna get back to that. One of the things that's really interesting about the Old Testament is that and the Jews in the Old Testament is that they don't take the path of Cain. Every time they're walloped by God, which is like fairly frequently, they say, we must have done something wrong and we have to set ourselves right. And that's a, an unbelievably heroic attitude because that's the alternative to cursing fate. It's like you take the responsibility for failure onto yourself and you think, well, if I was just, maybe if I just had my act together a little bit more, if I took advantage of every opportunity that was put in front of me, if I wasn't resentful and bitter, then I could have done something that would have tilted the situation in a different direction. And like, that's almost inevitably true. Dostoevsky, I think, said something like, every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's a, it's a crazy statement, right? It's a crazy statement and he was a pretty, extreme person in many, many ways. But there's a level at which that's metaphysically true, you know, because what happens is that 
it's it's failure to act often that's the most catastrophic you know i mean i've uh, it's 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 to not do the right thing when the when the situation presents itself and it's very specific you know you're constantly in situations where you could do the right thing if you were willing to take a risk that's actually of relatively moderate size and you know that you could take the risk and you know that you should take the risk and you don't and that happens to people all the time and then what happens is the thing that they didn't oppose grows a little bit and they shrink a little bit and that starts a loop hey it is far more fun to die on your sword than to die on someone else's i'm inspired youtube we're going to make this the episode thing you'll get whatever you want tyler but this is the f- core of it you just saw it on stage oh sorry you just saw it on stage Dying on your sword is better than dying on someone else's. So many of you are doing things, making decisions, and navigating your lives based on somebody else's thesis. You're doing it because you think it's the right thing because your dad's telling you it's the right thing. You're doing what you're doing right now because you're pandering to your boss even though you don't believe in it. This is how it's gonna play out. You are doing things right now. Yesterday, you made a decision that you don't believe in, but you're smart. You did it because you know how your company scores. Here's the problem with disruption and innovation. Right now, you're being rewarded for being a yes person, and in 36 months, you're gonna be fired for being a yes person. And you're doing it because you just need the security of your job. I'm telling you right the f- now, if you're watching this vlog, and you've got, like, that means you have a certain DNA. Please, I implore you, please die on your sword, not somebody else's. If you're gonna lose, it's much more fun to lose based on what you thought. Do you know, I mean, do you know how many of you are gonna lose on somebody else's thesis? It's gonna kill at you, it's gonna eat at you, it's going to be the worst feeling, so please, Pause this video right now and ask yourself, am I doing my shit because of me? Then you're good, whether you're winning or losing. Or am I doing it because somebody else is telling me it's the right way, or I'm subconsciously pandering to please somebody or something because I need the short-term stability. Figure that the fuck out. You know it, and I know it. You just need to do something about it. I was just uh, having a debate with a friend of mine, and we got stuck on the difference between fault and responsibility. She kept talking about how something was somebody's fault, it's somebody's fault. And I was like, it really, it don't matter whose fault it is that something is broken if it's your responsibility to fix it. For example, it's, it's not somebody's fault if their father was an abusive alcoholic, but it's for damn sure their responsibility to figure out how they're gonna deal with those traumas and try to make a life out of it. It's not your fault if your partner cheated and ruined your marriage, but it is for damn sure your responsibility to figure out how to take that pain and how to overcome that and build a happy life for yourself. Fault and responsibility do not go together. It sucks, but they don't. When something is somebody's fault, We want them to suffer. We want them punished. We want them to to pay. And we want it to be their responsibility to fix it. But that's, that's not how it works, especially when it's your heart. Your heart, your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. As long as we're pointing the finger and 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 stuck in whose fault something is. We're jammed and trapped into victim mode. When you're in victim mode, you are stuck in suffering. The road to power is in taking responsibility. Your heart, your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. Hey, I wanna talk to you today about success. Success, duty, obligation, responsibility. If you approach it any other way, which most people are, Most people think, well, I'll be successful if the economy works. I'll be successful if something happens. I'll be successful if I win the lottery ticket. Look, you're not gonna be successful if you don't demand it, if you literally don't stake a claim to it and say, this is mine, it's in part, you're not gonna have it, I promise you. I know, I'm telling you from experience. I spent the first 25 years of my life like like a spectator, watching other people get successful and then wondering why I wasn't. Success is your duty, it is your responsibility, I'm sorry, your obligation and your responsibility, it's important. I was broke, you understand? I was broke. 
when I was 25. Dead broke. I'm not talking about financially broke. Let me tell you something. No, I didn't have any money in my pocket. I didn't have any credit cards. Nobody would give me credit, okay? Didn't have a driver's license, okay? 1970 Ford Maverick. I had a 1970 Ford Maverick. No air, no heat, no door handles. The freaking floor was rusted, okay? I lived in a 275 square foot apartment, maybe 300 square feet if you counted the little step out in the front of the front door. Paid 275 a month and I was late almost every month. So don't tell me about your money problems, man, okay? Don't tell me about where you were born. Don't tell me about your bad breaks. Don't tell me about what your daddy did or your uncle felt you up or something, did some kind of weird thing to you and I'll, I'll ruin your head or your sister abused you or whatever, okay? Look, we all got problems. You gotta fix your problems now. You gotta get your money right. So at 25 years old, I'm like, I'm getting my money right, I'm done. No more excuses, no more crybaby, no more blame. I'm getting my freaking money right. Who are you competing with? And whatever you do, you have to ask yourself, what's your edge, right? What is the one thing that gives you a competitive edge? If you don't have an answer, you can't start that company. You're gonna lose, right? I said it before, if you're trying to compete with me, you better know, know a whole lot more than I do about whatever business we're in, because otherwise, I'm gonna kick your ass, right? So you have to ask yourself, what is your competitive advantage? And with that competitive advantage, What's the best way for me to get customers who are willing to write me a check? My, one of my skill sets has always been, I've been able to walk into any type of business and understand their company. You know, understand how they make money, understand how they compete. So I can walk into a shoe store, I can walk into a hospital or whatever and say, all right, here's my technology, here's how it gives you an advantage. And I try to do the same thing. On Shark Tank, you hear us say it all the time. What is your competitive advantage? Just saying it's my passion, do you ever walk into 7-Eleven and say, wow, I'm shopping here at 7-Eleven because they're really passionate? <laughs> no, right? And when, when you go and you make your, think about your own buying decisions. What makes you decide to buy? Now you might wanna support veteran-owned businesses. I always, when it's a toss-up, yes, right? But at some point you have to grow beyond the community and you have to be able to say, I, you can walk into any situation and know without any doubt in your mind, this is why you are the best product or service and you are the best company to provide that product or service. Period, end of story. If you can't do that, you have to ask yourself, who is doing it? What are they doing that gives them that edge? What allows them to compete or help their customers better than you can? Right, because that's what it's all about. We all as consumers make buying decisions. And we, the people who are buying our stuff, product or service, use the same thought process for those buying decisions. So always put yourself in your potential customer's shoes. What is it that I have that makes it a no-brainer for them to buy from me? If it's, I'm nice, I'm passionate, you're in trouble, right? There's gotta be something because even if you can get some customers, how are you gonna grow it? How are you gonna sustain it? And what's gonna keep the next person from coming in and doing the same thing? Because look, with success comes additional challenges. The more you succeed, the more people say, damn, okay, that's an opportunity. I think I can do that better. And so success isn't, look where I'm at. Success is go, 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 go. Right? I mean, people say, wow, you've done this. And I'm, I'm still going, right? To me, business is the ultimate sport. And there's nobody on the face of the earth that's more competitive than I am. I've said that to Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, you name it, right? Any athlete, any business person, it is the ultimate sport and we're competing all the time. What is it that gives you an edge that allows you to compete? How do you sustain that? And how do you find more people that say yes to buying that? That is going to be the key to your business. And how do you sell it? You're going to, as of right now, this moment, you're gonna focus entirely on one thing. Getting so good you cannot be ignored. Now, what do I mean by that? Getting so good that you deliver results. Deliver results for yourself, to deliver results for other people. I would just tell you, every business owner on the planet is looking for people that can help them grow their business. That's it. They care about one thing and one thing only. Can you deliver results? So the good news here is, 
you can always count on humans to be selfish. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, they're passionate about the things that they're passionate about. They're trying to accomplish the things they're trying to accomplish. And if you can show how you can help with that, people are gonna want you no matter what. I don't give a shit if you have a college education. Like that is so irrelevant to me. A college education merely tells me that you've been formally trained. It doesn't tell me if you're actually good. Now, on a resume can be very powerful because I'll look at that in a shorthand. I'll say, oh shit. Like, they probably are ahead of somebody that doesn't have those things. But if you're out in the real world getting results, I'm all for that. And let me tell you how fast you can convey that with something. Like, if I'm like right now, hey everybody, by the way, P.S., if you're a director of marketing, we want to hear from you. Especially if you understand content marketing. So, I think... Most people in this community know that Jared has moved up to San Jose. I don't do remote employees. He's chasing his own thing. That guy was amazing. And I'm super heartbroken that he left. But now we're looking for somebody to replace him with. And what I look for is I look for people that have done shit. I don't, I actually don't even look at their college education. I don't even scan that far down in the resume. I just want to know what are you doing? What have you accomplished? And like, can you put together a comp, like, a, what is the word I'm looking I'm having a stroke. Uh, 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 comprehensive isn't the word, but I'm gonna stick with it. Cohesive, there we go. Can you put together a cohesive, coherent resume, which you'd be shocked how few people actually can. So put that together, maybe a super brief cover letter, maybe you hit the person up on social, whatever. Anyway, it is really easy if you're actually good, it's really easy to convince other people that you're actually good. So focus all your time and energy on actually getting good. Drive is the mode where you're in charge of your thoughts, okay? It's where you are fully awake, you are present, and you are driving your thoughts and actions. When you're doing that, your prefrontal cortex is active. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that you need in order to learn new behavior, in order to do something difficult, in order to do something uncertain, in order to do strategic thinking. So I'm gonna give you an example. So I'm a righty. If I were to try to write with my left hand, mm -hmm. you know, like you know, Lewis is gonna sure. torture me and tie my hand behind my back and sure. make me like do this, I could do it. It would look like I was writing with my foot. <laughs> and if Lewis came up to me and said, hey Mel, you want some bulletproof coffee? I'd be like, Lewis, I'm, tr I'm trying to concentrate. I can't do this. My prefrontal cortex would be el fuego mm -hmm. because it is firing on all cylinders to communicate to my hand new behavior. So. The thing that's cool about that is that you can use a simple trick. The moment you feel yourself hesitate, the moment you've got one of those moments where you know that you need to, this is that moment that Lewis talks to you about where you got to step outside of your comfort zone and you've got to lean into your passion and you've got to really take some risks and you got to feel the fear and you got to do it anyway. That's the moment where you just woke up and now you got a decision to make. Are you gonna drift back into the habits or are you going to awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward and focus and do something new? When we came to America, we were poor and broke, the way I look at it, um, because we would always run out of money before run out of month. We decide, you know, do we do without electricity or, or gas? Because some months we couldn't afford to pay both. And, you know, being broke is being without money. Being poor is being kind of scarcity-minded, poor-minded. And we just realized that Money's for the rich, money's for the, the Americans, it's for the people who were born here, who went to college. And that's how I grew up. And later, Jim Franco taught me that, hey, you know what? You can't be scarcity minded. You can't, you have to live in abundance. You have to understand that people just want a solution to a problem and they don't care about the color of your skin, about the level of your education. Um, they want a solution to a problem. So he taught me, he had to break all these old patterns that I had, right? What were some of the patterns? Some of the patterns were that money's for the white folk and not for the foreigners. You actually thought? Yeah, I really, because that's, that's how it was, because every time we went and got, got more food stamps, it was all foreigners. There was no white people in line, at least not, not in the parts of Santa Ana that I was raised. Um, and so I felt that money was for the people who were telling us to leave this country, go back to your own country. And that also puts a chip on your shoulder, right, against them. And so. I guess I had some reverse racism towards, towards white America. Now I realize for no apparent reason, there was a couple of idiots in, in every culture I imagine, right? But so that was one pattern that I had. Another pattern that I had was that being proud to be blue collar. Like my dad was like, and he, he still says this, work is holy. And I believe that work is holy. 
but the fact that he had so many jobs, a paper route, pumping gas, worked at a pizzeria. And so because of that mindset, blue collar, blue collar, we were always this blue collar mentality and I took pride in being blue collar. Another pattern Jim Franco had to, had to break was he's like, dude, be white collar. Don't use the shovel, sell the shovel. I'd never heard that phrase before. I'm the guy that took pride in, I could dig a deeper hole, a deep, deeper trench, I could, I could outwork you, but that's still trading time for dollars. And so to be able to break those limiting belief systems that I had, to me was huge. And all of a sudden I realized I'm no longer poor minded. I may end up broke again. I do really well now, but I may make one or two bad decisions with my money or my investment and end up being broke again, but I'll never be poor. And I know how to get back from broke because I know how to add value to society, solve problems in exchange for money. But I'll never be poor again. And poor is a state of mind of feeling out of control scarcity minded, taking pride in being blue collar. No one should ever take pride in being blue collar, period, period. You've got a brain, you've got a solution to a problem that people want to pay for, put it out there. So when you say scarcity minded, abundant minded, what do you mean? Well, a scarcity minded person says, uh oh, someone else opened up a gym, you know, across the street from me, they're going to put me out of business, I better charge less, right? The abundant minded person says, someone else opened up a gym across the street from me, I better out-service them, out-work them, out-social media them, right? So the scarcity-minded person is always the sky is falling, the chicken little mentality, the, oh my gosh, if Trump goes into office, then we're all screwed. Oh my gosh, if Hillary goes into office, then we're all screwed. I don't care who's in office anymore. I control my own economy. The economy can crash and go back up and back down again. I will find a way, as Tony Robbins says, I'm built for winter, I just didn't know it. And so more people need to be abundant-minded in that if the economy crashes, I just have to deliver more value and create this category of one about myself. If competition shows up, I have to out-service them, out-work them, out-social media them, versus shrivel up and die. Persuasion and anything. So if you want to persuade your children, if you want to persuade someone to take a look at your faith, if you want to persuade someone in business, if you want to persuade someone to help you in anything or help them in anything, it's real simple for me, monster belief. And so you can't transfer to me that which you're not experiencing yourself, right? So you can't give me that. People are always trying to come up with a magic word, the magic clothes, the magic this. And there are words you should and shouldn't use in persuasion, no question about it, right? There are, thing, there are words that are more effective than other words. And clearly to be successful in any business, you need to know what those words are in your business. But the best persuaders, the best motivators, the best speakers, the best physicians, the best school teachers, the best parents are incredible persuaders. And what they do is they come from a monster place of conviction and belief that they can transfer you to because people respond to energy much more than they do words. They respond to what they feel, not what they hear and see. Hear and see are real low level influencers. Energy, spirit, transfer of energy is what people respond to. And so I'm cognizant all the time of getting in a state of total belief and certainty about what it is that I'm going to represent or speak on if I'm speaking on stage about a particular topic and then transferring that energy into people. And that seems generic or hokey, but it's actually what great persuaders do. In fact, if you're listening to this, you think of anybody that you know who's incredibly persuasive. They may have great words, they probably do, but it's something you feel from them, right? And that's the difference between a great doctor and a so-so doctor. A great doctor says, here's the prescription, you're out of here. Another one- Is they, this gonna work or not? Right? I don't know. The yeah. Another one, you leave there feeling that you're going to be healed, yeah. feeling you're in good hands. You feel their certainty, you feel their confidence. Same when you hear a speaker, if you're buying real estate from somebody, but it's not just buying things, it's a, a great pastor in a church. A great person, if you do TM, who's taught you TM, it's their certainty, it's the energy you feel. And so for me, it's always getting to, I have to really believe what I'm saying. I have to really feel it to transfer it to. I say this to people all the time. Most important here is, it isn't me. It's you. And sure, you may have grabbed some little foothold from the podcast or from one of the books, but it isn't me that changes you, it's you. You set the small goals, you achieve those goals, then set some more and achieve those and set some more goals, maybe a little bit bigger, but not that much bigger. Just start. Start small. Start with changing tomorrow morning, just tomorrow morning. 
get that squared away and then move on to the next day and the next and move your life to a better place one little step one little victory at a time if you're in politics the media the tech industry working as an entrepreneur or a teacher or a construction worker or a caregiver you know the problems we are all facing and i urge each one of you to ask yourselves what do we do now that's a big question what is it in your life that you think you cannot accomplish or what is it that people have said that you cannot do wouldn't it feel really good to prove them all wrong what gives me strength all the time is to be able to have formulated a group of people around me that are my friends and my family mm -hmm. you know those two words are enmeshed in my opinion but it's given me a, a, a grounding that as, as insane as my life can be sometimes is always refreshing and they're always so honest with me and I'm so thankful for that. Everything at the end of the day when you're making a movie starts with the material and, and, and how well written the script is. I've never seen a silk purse made from a sow's ear. I've yes. never seen it happen wherein a crap script with crap characters, a director somehow found a way to make a masterpiece out of it. And that's the constant struggle that we all sort of have as actors is finding those gems and that's why people grab onto them like vultures. When, when you find a great piece of material or a great script, it's like, you should see what happens. It's like a piranha feeding fest. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants it. Starting with Lincoln Lawyer, there was a time when I said I wanted to recalibrate my relationship with my career. I remember saying that. I remember thinking my career, I'm enjoying it. I love what it's given me. I like going to work. I like the things I've been doing. But everything I started reading, I felt like, oh, be the, uh, it's another version of something I've done where I feel like I could do it next week. And I remember going, well, wait a minute, before you get mad at thinking you could do something next week, that's a valid feeling. Don't just say no to something because you feel like you can naturally do it. But then I said, okay, fair. I'll shake with you on that, McConaughey, but <laughs> let me find something that I, that I don't know how what to do with that next week or the week after. Let me find something that I really like, but I'm going, ooh, I'm not sure. That that scares me, that shakes my floor. And I was fortunate enough, because um, that schedule left, check I got in Angel in the Outfield, to know that I, my rent was paid. I was fortunate enough to know my kids were gonna eat. I was just shepherding my first son into the world. So I had that to take care of my time. And I said, it's a great time to go into the shadows and be a, be a father and sit back and see if something turns you on from the inside or if something finds you, if you, you're the target that can draw the air. But let's, we're okay, rent's paid, kids are gonna eat, we can take some time off. I know he was thinking about like, oh, I'm done, but I didn't know how long the dry spell was gonna go. So I said no to some of the things that were similar to what I had been doing before. And it took a while, I had to sit down with my agent and say, hey, well, I'm, well, I'm really gonna do this and I need your help with my commitment to this because after eight months, if I'm, the same thing comes in with a big $10 million paycheck, it starts to read better <laughs> and funnier. <laughs> They just, I promise you, those, I mean, the, the same words. All of a sudden, it's, it's kind of, it's, I think this thing's great. I think I can find an angle. No, I can make it a different experience for me. So, so I said, I'm going to need your help bunkering down here and, 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 and saying no to some things. And so I'm going to need you to be a gatekeeper. One, to keep them from getting to me. Two, let's be real clear. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm looking for some different things to do. He hold up, he handled that. My wife, we said, we don't know how long it's gonna be dry. Um, then after they quit sending those, then it did get dry, then nothing came for about a year. Wow. There was nothing. And I didn't have any sleepless nights or oh my gosh. I was like, no, I'll find something, I'll write. I was writing a lot. I was turning myself on creatively. And as I said, I had my first son to shepherd into the world. And then the funny thing happened, the beautiful thing happened that that somehow the target drew the arrow. And I think, in my opinion is, I became a new good idea by, re being, by removing myself. Mm. I became, William Friedkin calls for the first time, Steven Soderbergh calls for the first time. Somehow in that two years, I became a fresh new idea that I don't think I was two, three years prior. How that works, I'm not sure, because I didn't send a memo out. <laughs> 
you know, but it did happen. I don't look at myself through other people's eyes. I had an interesting discussion with Larry Graham and uh, a journalist upstairs about uh, criticism of music. You know, if you're a true artist, you're using the gift you've been given from God. Yeah. And um, to uh, criticize a gift from God is sort of to criticize God. Yeah. You now, you can cut that any way you want, but <laughs> it's the truth. So, yeah. you know, I looked at the writer, I said, I wouldn't criticize your writing here. I'm not a writer. I don't write books. You know, I wouldn't. The way to transform yourself is through your work. Now, I know this runs counter to our prevailing cultural prejudices. Work is too ugly, too boring, too banal. Self-transformation, we think, comes through a spiritual journey, therapy, a guru who tells us what to do, intense group experiences and social experiences and drugs. <laughs> but most of these are ways of running away from ourselves and relieving our chronic boredom. They are not connected to process, and so any changes that occur don't last. Instead, through our work, we can actually connect to who we are instead of running away. And by entering that slow, organic process, we can actually change ourselves from the inside out in a way that's very real and very lasting. This process involves a journey of self-discovery that can be seen as quite spiritual, if you like. And in the end of this process, we contribute something unique and meaningful to our culture through our work, which is hardly ugly, boring, or banal. The best description of writing a novel that I ever heard uh, is actually in uh, Thomas Williams' book, uh, uh, The Hair of Harold Drew, which is about a novelist trying to write a novel, and it just covers like one or two days in this process and a lot of things happen to him. It's a fabulous book. But he says that writing a novel is like building a little campfire on an empty, dark plain. And one by one, these characters come out of the dark and each one has a little pile of wood and they put it on the fire. And if you're very lucky before the fire goes out, it's this big bonfire and all the characters stand around it and warm themselves. And that's the way it's always been for me. I have a good friend over in Vermont, uh, John Irving. And John says that he always begins a novel by writing the last line. And to me, that's like eating your dessert before you eat the meal. And uh, I don't, uh, Everybody works a different way, and God bless John, and he's done some wonderful work in his lifetime, and he'll probably do some more, but I could never write a book that way. The way that I think of it, you know, is that fire. I love that particular image, but I've also always thought of it in terms of there's a little thread, a little red thread that goes into a hole in the baseboard, and you just start to pull it out, and you see what's on the other end of it, and sooner or later you get there. For me, the fun of writing novels isn't in the finished product, which I don't care about that much. There's a guy who was looking at my shelf over there. All the, the books are on the shelf. And uh, to me, those are like dead skin, uh, the things that are, that are done. But I love the process. Well, I left college because I knew exactly what I wanted uh, to do. And some of you know too, but some of you don't. Or maybe you thought you knew, but are now questioning that choice. Maybe you're sitting there trying to figure out how to tell your parents that you want to be a doctor and not a comedy writer. <laughs> well, what you choose to do next is what we call in the movies the character-defining moment. Now, these are moments you're very familiar with, like in the last Star Wars, The First Force Awakens, when Rey realizes the Force is with her, or Indiana Jones choosing Mission Over Fear by jumping into a pile of snakes. Now, in a two-hour movie, you get a handful of character-defining moments, but in real life, you face them every day. Life is one strong, long string of character-defining moments. And I was lucky that at 18, I knew what I exactly wanted to do, but I didn't know who I was. 
I, how, how could I and how could any of us? Because for the first 25 years of our lives, we are trained to listen to voices that are not our own. Parents and professors fill our heads with wisdom and information, and then employers and mentors take their place and explain how this world really works. And usually these voices of authority make sense, but sometimes doubt starts to creep into our heads and into our hearts. And even when we think that's not quite how I see the world, it's kind of easier just to nod in agreement and go along. And for a while, I let that going along define my character because I was repressing my own point of view because like in that Nielsen song, everybody was talking at me so I couldn't hear the echoes of my mind. And at first, the internal voice I needed to listen to was hardly audible and it was hardly noticeable, kind of like me in high school. But then I started paying more attention and my intuition kicked in. And I want to be clear that your intuition is different from your conscience. They work in tandem, but here's the distinction. Your conscience shouts, here's what you should do, while your intuition whispers, here's what you could do. Listen to that voice that tells you what you could do. Nothing will define your character more than that. Because once I turned to my intuition and I tuned into it, I, certain projects began to pull me into them and others I turned away from. Sleep at the same time, wake up at the same time, seven days a week, no matter what. Really? It, sleep is so valuable, it's so important, yeah, it's so that. underrated. I used to think that, I, I, here's what I was, I'm a fighter jet. I would literally walk around the house, honey, I'm a fighter jet. Fighter jet, you know, doesn't even come down to get refueled. They're up there getting right, refueled, right? Right, right, right. We've all seen the YouTube videos. Yeah. Well, the fighter jet, if they leave those afterburners on too long, they just fall out of the sky, mm. which I, no one had told me. Right. Until I fell out of the sky. I was having essential tremors mm. and anxiety attacks and not realizing it. And as I got better at sleep, those just went away because the one discipline leads to another and to another. How you do anything is how they you do, do everything, everything yeah. right? And uh, so that, that one thing that he taught me or I learned through him, and we'd be in Vegas, we'd run a mastermind together because now we run a mastermind together. And at eight o'clock and pfft, he's gone. Buddy, where are you going? Like, sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna sleep. by nine or whatever, yeah, right? Or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he powers off 30 minutes, all his electronics before. So now I do the same thing, I power off. I'm, I don't go to bed and then do this. Yeah. I powered off 30 minutes before and my mind stops racing and the left and right side start reconciling of the information I took in throughout the day versus the information I keep consuming, taking yeah. it, right? Until I fall asleep and then Lord knows what happens in my brain. Right, right, right. <laughs> what time do you go to bed and wake up? 10.30. Uh, 10.30, 10 10 wow. I'm in bed, uh, wake up at 5.30. Wow. And, and that's... It's been like no matter what, first. even if you're in Vegas or mm -hmm. traveling around the world or whatever, yeah, I'll adjust to that time zone real quickly. And 10.30, wow. I'm in bed. 5.30 a.m., I wake up, and I go right through my rituals.